everybody, welcome back to episode number 14 of Van Halen Stories. Today, my guest is Nelson. It's Blanton, right? Blanton, yes. Blanton, okay, out of Los Angeles, California. And we're getting together today to talk about Van Halen, of course. And Nelson's been out there for a long, long time from, originally you said from Virginia. Maryland. Maryland, sorry. Maryland. Yeah. And um, Same thing. <laughs> close, right. Came out there in the uh, in the '80s and and saw the whole '80s scene go down and and has some interesting stories about interactions around the Van Halen camp and we're going to talk about all that of course and uh, so anyway you know just kind of give people the overview you gave you just gave me off camera you know where you came from how you ended out up and out out in L.A. and then you know we'll get into the Van Halen details. Um. Well, late '86, like I was telling you, the, my cousin I had a cousin who was living out here in L.A that was a music supervisor on a couple of shows and he knew about the sunset strip scene. He wasn't into that. He was a more of a classical guy and stuff like that. But he was like, Hey man, for what you do, you need to go to LA. And I had seen it in all the magazines and stuff, you know, the, like I said, the metal, ed metal edge and circus and all those things. Mm -hmm. And so I told my band that I had back there six months, I'm, I'll, I'll be in LA. And that was at uh, Thanksgiving of 86. And the bass player is like, I'll go. The drummer's like, well, my girlfriend this. And the singer is my girlfriend that. Like, okay, bye. And so May 1st, we were here. And our friend, another friend of ours uh, who was getting into doing sound, he came with us. And we just, like, three musketeers did out here. And then, like I was telling you earlier, that the first Monday night we were here, we went to the whiskey. And Bobby Dahl's getting in a fight. And we had drug him out of the bar because we had just seen them in January in, in Washington, D.C. And and um so that's kind of how the whole odyssey began and then even that summer we started putting our band together our drummer that we uh had met worked at capitol records and he knew somebody at warner brothers and so we were already getting the band together and so we we're our our head was already in like record deal record deal record deal right, right. and so he knew he knew ted templeman's sister roberta pearson and she was like, well, as soon as you guys get something going on, some demos or something, let's get them to me and I'll get them to Ted. Well, simultaneously at that time, the Bullet Boys were coming together. And they were rehearsing at the same place we were rehearsing, a place called Hot Dog uh, Studios out in Arlita, which is kind of, I don't know, northeast of here someplace, 20 miles or so. And so Roberta was like, well, Ted's really hot with you know, the bullet boys and they're doing their thing, but he likes your band. And this time, you know, this is kind of in the fall. We had our singer and we we're starting to do some stuff, but give him some time. He's going to launch the bullet boys and see what happens. So that was kind of our first, as you know, creeping into the Van Halen world was, was right. that. Right. Right. And it just kind of all just, you know, you just kind of satellite a lot of these people. Like, you know, I was kind of saying, you know, I've always known people who know people, mm -hmm. and I just kind of tag along and kind of, you know, we kind of go in and out like that. And that's kind of how it worked. And, um, right. Everybody, you know, there's, there's, you know, the circles that we run in, you know, that's uh, right. Right. You know, right. Necessarily, right. you know, necessarily, you know, I mean, it, it's just like you said, you know, people that know people, it, it's a, it's a circle of people. And then somehow, you know, all through your life, you run into these people still. <laughs> yeah. Well, Ever. you know, speaking of that, which is really funny. So the A&R guy, Barry Squire was the head of A&R at Warner Bros at that time. And he was the one who was kind of spearheading us trying to get us with Ted and all that stuff too. So uh, years later, yeah, I'm talking, I don't know, this may have been seven or eight years ago. There's a restaurant in Burbank called Smokehouse. And I was there one night with a friend of mine, just jamming in the, in the bar. We we're just doing a little bar jam. Mm -hmm. And he comes up to me and he goes, Hey man, weren't you in the band grand slam? I go, Barry. He goes, and he goes, dude, I'm still, I'm still sorry about what happened. I'm like, what, what are you talking about? about how that that stuff with Ted and trying to make it all work out never happened. It's like, well, that was, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years. I mean, who knows how long ago that was 25 years ago. Right, I'm right. over. It's cool. <laughs> right. it's funny, but it's like, you know, there's still people, you know, the orbits and people come in. They're like this, you know, it's crazy. You know? Well, yeah, we're all still in the business. There's all, if you're still around, you know, you, there's, yeah, if you're, I if mean, you're still around, that's the key. Yeah. That's, that is the key because you do, you know, uh, it's amazing to me, like all of my friends that are still in the business that, you know, we're, we all still are in contact. We, you know, and maybe not 
direct contact all the time, but we do still talk to each other. And, you know, this is going back right, right, right. 30 years with people, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it, and well, I think I mentioned, um, you know, Robbie Crane? Yeah, sure. So I've known Robbie since at least, I'm well, 87, probably late 87 is when I first met Robbie. Yeah. And so we're still in touch all these years later. I mean, it, we, you know, it's years sometimes in between. The last time I physically saw him was 2012 in a uh, studio. I was recording with Billy Ray Cyrus and he was in the same studio with George Lynch. And so that's the last time I've seen him. But I mean, it's like, it's crazy how you st- people that are still around are still around, you know, which is, right, is very right. cool. Well, those people have learned that the best way to be successful at anything is just to keep going. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And was it's it for- funny, the, just real quick, the funny Robbie Crane story, when I, I think it might have been the first night I met him was we were playing at Gazzari's. And I don't know if you can see this red guitar sitting back here. Yeah, yeah, I can. I, I was on, you know, always on the guitar player side of the stage. You know, that's where all the great guitar players were all, you know, I always want to be on that side because that's where Ed's at and that's where Jimmy Page is at. It's like, you know, it's where everybody, so I'm always on that side of the stage. Well, the PA was on the side of the stage also. And I had, had turned my back like this and I came back around and hit the side of one of the cabinets and snapped the headstock off mm-hmm. right here, right across there. And so it's just dangling, but it's got the Floyd Rose on it. So it didn't even go out of tune. So right. Robbie had I had been a bass tech, I think, with Bobby Dahl getting to that poison thing again. He somehow showed up with a pair of wire cutters and cut the strings off. So and just took off that piece. So I just had with the point was just there, but the locking nut kept it in tune for the rest of the show. Mm-hmm, right. And that's the first I think that's I I think I even mentioned that to him the last time I saw him. He goes, I can't believe you remember that. I'm like, well, is that stuck a, in my head. That's is that a Paul Dean guitar? This one? Yeah, what well, no, was this? Is- what was it? Originally? I built this. Okay. All I right. built this in eighty. I built this in eighty six. This is a Charvel neck. Okay. It's a, I, I bought this neck in eighty five at a play in Virginia, a store called Venomans in uh, Wheaton, Maryland. This is an original Floyd Rose from when they first the first ones when they came out. I broke two of the saddles at some point. Um, I don't know where the bar is. The I lost the bar years ago. Um, <laughs> What's the Seymour body? Duncan Custom. The body it was just a body. I don't know. I, I bought it, you know, but this actual pickup here does work. Right. And that's why I was talking about like, <laughs> when we were talking, you know, messages and stuff. It's like my style of playing was more a Stevie Ray Vaughan, Eddie Van Halen hybrid, more of a blues, really into Keith Richards, that kind of stuff. But my my rhythm stuff, I would guess, would probably be more in the Ed vein at some point years and years ago. Right, but, right. I just like that single coil, you know, neck sound, even back, you know, in, in those days, you know. Right, right. You know what? Well, you know, it turned me on to the neck pickup, which is, which would seem, which would seem nuts, but Ingve did because when Ingve came around, everybody was all on the back pickup all the time. You know, everybody, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we're all one pickup guys. And then Ingve came out and he was flipping back and forth between the front and back. And I got, you know, right, I, right. I got enamored with the sound of the front single coil. You know, at that yeah, point. yeah, and that's yeah that that pickup that single coil is actually out of a strat that I still have around here somewhere that was mid seventies, and when I got it, it had a remember the Kaler tremolos where you have to yeah. dig a big hole out of the body. Yeah. So the guy I got the guitar I had one of those Kalers on there, and it still had the two original single coils, but it had a humbucker in it. Mm. And I've since restored the guitar and put uh, um, what are those? Uh, the rails they're um, yeah, the hot rails joe barden joe barden pickups okay and those things the, he he's in virginia if but i i think he passed away but the original joe bardens were in the 80s were like these really hot boutique pickups and i have a, a set of those i put in and restored it to close to original as possible but cool <laughs> excuse me so the, from the uh the whole your deal with the when you're working around ted templeman tell me more about that whole situation well, I hadn't met him till sometime in maybe 91 or 92 for the first time. Mm-hmm. But our drummer at that time was the kind of the go between and with Barry Squire and Roberta and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But I, I mean, I met him superficially a few times over the years, just at parties, just and, you know, get a couple of drinks and he'd have a couple of drinks. And next thing you know, you're shooting the shit, you know, and you just try to and everybody wants to know Van Halen stuff when right. you talk to Ted Tumpman. No right. one cares about the Doobie Brothers and all that other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
Poor guy. Yeah, I'm, That's all it is. <laughs> I know. I know. It's like he has a catalog of work. It's just absolutely amazing. And all people want to talk about is Van Halen, but right, for right. obvious reasons, you know, for geeks like me, you know, it's like, well, that's what I want to know. Did you ask you him know? anything in particular that you remember? Um, I don't know. He would just say things sometimes, you know, just kind of get a conversation going. Mm-hmm. The one thing that I don't know if this can be verified or I haven't, I've never looked, but I think I mentioned too that he told me, uh, cause we were talking about different Van Halen records and sounds and things like that, that the first five seconds or so of hot for teacher, that rumbling sound is actually Ed's Lamborghini Mira idling. Right. Right. And they right. tuned, electric, they tuned electric drums to, to kind of, match the, the tones and then al comes in and does a thing it could be bullshit i mean i don't know no it is but, it's real i mean if you there is actually isolated tracks of it and i put and there's a video on my channel where i separated that the eight lamborghini yeah and right, right, right. I, mean, I know they did go ahead i know in panama the you know the revving thing at the end but sure. um sure that lamborghini but, thing uh there there is a that video on my channel where i isolated it and you can hear not only that it start up, you know, because it starts up from scratch. Oh, right, right, okay. When he shuts it off, it's at a certain point in the song, and it makes almost like a whistly sound. Uh huh. <laughs> shuts oh, off. Oh yeah, yeah. And it's uh, yeah, yeah. You just never notice it unless you hear it isolated. But yeah, it's pretty cool. Right, right, right. right. But speaking of, and I, I mentioned to you that uh, that Lamborghini Mira. Mm-hmm. I worked at Claudio's on Van Nuys right. Boulevard, in the summer of '88, detailing cars. And I never met Ed. He didn't, I, the car would just be there. And then Claudia would say, you know, make sure you take care of this. This is for someone special. I'm like, I know who this car belongs to. I mean, he would never tell me, but it's like, I know. And uh, I believe Jay Leno had one that was blue. And those are fantastic cars. And so that would get it all spotless. And then, you know, it would come back the next day and it wouldn't be there. So, I mean, I don't know who was bringing him in and out, but. You know, so here's the question was- I got. Question I got for you because you know Eddie's known for sure. the Mira, right? He's known for the Lamborghini Mira, but he did have a Countach at one point. Black one. Yeah, a black one. Did it have gold yeah. rims or was it? You remember? I don't even remember. I can't. I uh, one of my guests wrote in it. Steve Rosen, the the writer. Steve. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah he, he wrote in it. We did we did a little section on that car, but I did uh, that. I was that car ever down there? It may have been because there was at that time there was a few of them around. Right, I remember right. a white one. I remember seeing a white one. It, Ed's might have been there. I, yeah. I, I would. Carlos know. Carlos Carvazio had one too. Well, speaking of that, his was white. Yeah, right. That's what. I, that's and then what I, later on in nine, I don't know what year it was, ninety one, ninety two, sometime they also were rehearsing at that same rehearsal studio we did at Hot Dog Rehearsal. We rehearsed there for years. And I remember going, it was a street called Bradford that the, the, the industrial park was on. And I remember passing Carlos pushing that car on, on Bradford. Pushing it. <laughs> he was pushing it. Wow. And I don't know if it run out of gas or broken down, but I was like, and to me, it was very poignant of a, um, a metaphor for the time. Right. You know, right, it's right, like, right. because Quiet Riot had been so big and, you know, it's all, you know, now the guy's pushing his prize, so to speak, you know, and it's like, if it's run out of gas, I mean, it was just seemed very euphoric of what was happening and at that, that time. Insane. Yeah. Yeah. That but, car ended up, uh, yeah. ended up being sold, but he, uh, he did a video maybe a year or two ago where they were, they had him in the shop where they were doing a complete restore of his car, his old car. Right. And, uh, well, yeah, it wasn't his anymore. Huh? It wasn't his anymore. No, no, no. He gotten rid of it a long time ago, but, but he, he was he was there and uh, they were doing a complete total rest- restoration of it for somebody. So yeah, he, those cars were really cool. I mean, they were really unique. Um, yeah, they were. And they're, I mean, I know they have the new one now that looks nothing like it. But right, they're, right, they're, right. They're really cool. yeah. Poster car. But I only worked there that summer because it was just so hot working outside. Mm-hmm. It's like I don't care who these cars belong to. It sucks. Right, right. So, so you you uh, you you got some time with Templeman. And tell me some more stuff about, you know, your, your path through that whole period and then up through the Van Halen stuff, what we get, we're going to get to in 04. Yeah. Um, well, it, it was just kind of, you know, we were doing the scene, uh, going out and do smaller tours and playing, you know, just trying to make it all happen. We had really good management, and, but it was just at that time, it was just, you know, Warrant had gotten signed, um, which it's funny because I know the backstory on all these 
these bands and it's sometimes it's not as you know glamorous as it seemed sure. i remember uh seeing Janie lane show up to the, this club out there called the country club in his new corvette after they got signed i'm like well why are the other guys taking the bus theory you know <laughs> You're right right I thought the band got signed. Well, the band didn't get signed. Janie got signed. Like, oh, that's how that works. Okay. And the, all that business stuff started coming into, you know, sure. Into sure. focus and making sense. And so we were just, you know, beating, you know, just doing it like we could best we could. I mean, we were playing Gazaris, we were playing the whiskey, um, Roxy. We opened for a, the we actually played the Roxy a couple of times. That was a different kind of it was weird because you had Gazaris and the whiskey and the rainbow. Troubadour was down the hill. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, the whole scene revolved around Gazaris and the whiskey and you kind of go in between and, and the rainbow just for hanging out. So what was the, what was the Roxy's role in those clothes? Because to me, it always seemed like the Roxy was more the singer songwriter room, but I mean, yeah, or more established bands, bigger bands, you know, like okay. Jane's addiction and this band called red cross and those kind of bands were, you know, it's like a higher level bands. And I remember one show we did there with this band called circus of power. They were out of New York that were had had a couple songs out at that time, which were really cool. And they were grubby, bikery looking dudes. And and so it was us, Circus of Power and, and Kicks played out here. That, that was actually their last show they had played in L.A. until 2011, I think. OK. And um, because they would never tour out here because it was just, you know, they're big on the East Coast and the South, you know, Southeast and that stuff like that. So they sure. never really came out here much. But. Um, but, yeah, the Roxy was more of a showcase club. Okay. And that kind of stuff. But, you know, the scene was Gazari's, the whiskey. I mean, that was the scene. I mean, Troubadour, you'd had, I mean, it, you had to make an effort to go down there, even though it was two blocks, two or three blocks down the hill. Mm-hmm. It was just it was on Santa Monica Boulevard. It was just a little bit harder to hang out there. But, um, I mean, you'd Gil Turner's liquor store up on the corner, and you'd walk from Gil Turner's and you'd come down the sidewalk. Gazaris, um, it just that sidewalk would be five or six hundred people on there yeah. five, on a Friday or Saturday night. On a, and on a Wednesday night, it might be a hundred people. So yeah. it was just it was always going on, always. Yeah, but real no. quickly, uh, yeah, go ahead. Then, yeah, real quickly, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was gonna say really quickly. I mean, within six months of being here, our band kind of ascended to we were headlining Gazaris on a Friday night or Saturday night, at eleven o'clock, and that was like the coveted spots, and we were ended up being more of a Gazaris band than a whiskey band. It, it, was, it was even then it was kind of like that. And I've heard those stories where bands, you know, even in the seventies, you were a Gazaris band or you were a whiskey band or something like that, you know? Yeah. Van, Van Hillen had made that, that transition at some point from Gazaris. Yeah. To, it, yeah. Either way that I always read it anyway. And they, and what, what people have said is that, uh, Gazaris was more of a cover cover band place. And then with the whiskey was more at of that original, time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, more of an original, Room. Yeah, but I mean, by the time we were here, I mean, it was all, everybody was doing original music. Yeah, I mean, it was but you'd have six or seven bands on a on a bill every you know every single night. You'd have an eight thirty band, then you'd have a one o'clock in the morning. Yeah, there was it was and it was everybody in between. So and you're doing forty fives or an hour. What are you doing? Um, I think usually the headliner did about an hour. Okay, about an hour, forty five minutes to an hour. Yeah. Uh, opening. I mean, if you did eight thirty, it was usually half an hour. You know, in just and they were running them through, running through, and get that yeah. gear up those stairs and out the back. You know, and and next. It's a totally yeah. different, you know, vibe than what I do now. But back then, yeah, you would do show like showcase shows is basically what that is. Yeah. You do an hour, absolutely. Yeah, and yeah. I rarely do those now. Yeah, you know, I do three hours. You know, three hours, or I do four hours, but we do a couple breaks. You know, and it's all covers, of course. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's a different um, tempo and and the whole thing of having to drop into something and be on a hundred percent right out of the gate. It's a different thing than it is to settle in, you know, when you're doing multiple oh, yeah. sets and all that. Yeah, and it's funny because like those short sets were like it was such an event for each band. Sure. And the energy that it took to put that production on because we would play Gazaris. You know, my bass player had. I think at one time three SVT Ampegs. Yeah, yeah. I mean they're like refrigerators, you know, with the heads, the whole thing. That was on his side. They had to keep and everybody in the hill. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. And I was lazy, so I, I mean, at most, I all I ever had was two Marshall four twelve straight cabinets and one head kind of thing. Right. You know, it's right. like I'm like I, I'm not carrying that shit up and down these stairs because the whiskey. I mean, at Gazaris, you had to load out the back of the club, which was up like two flights of stairs wow. to the upper 
where the parking lot was up in the back. The back, yeah. And at the whiskey, you load it out right onto the sidewalk. Right out of the, you're done. They just put your shit on the sidewalk. You know, right, like right so, I'm like the front responsibility out front, right? Kind of like on the front side, right? Right on the right on the sidewalk. Yeah, right, right yeah. in front. It was pretty funny. But I, uh, speaking of the whiskey, I remember the first time playing there, getting into the Van Halen thing, standing right there where Ed stood. I mean, Jimi Hendrix played the whiskey. I mean, Eric Clapton. I mean, Led Zeppelin. But it was the Van Halen thing going. Holy shit! I'm I'm in you know standing in the footsteps you know kind of thing right here. Yeah, you're thinking of, if you're me, you're thinking about those first videos they shot at the whiskey. You know. Oh yeah. You really got me and Jamie's crying and all that. Ed's yeah, doing his hand like this, or somebody, one of us. Yeah. That, you know? You're thinking about you're thinking about those videos. That's what I always when I would go in there. You know, over the years, I would always think about that that spot. You know, in that whole. Yeah. Vibe. It's, yeah. it's kind of been updated since, but but yeah, it's it's a amazing room and, and it's great that it's still there i know i think they got historical status i'm not exactly sure yeah and it's funny about gazaris the gazaris that we played was not the gazaris van halen played okay. because they i think originally the building had been two stories and sometime maybe in the seven, late 70s early 80s where they opened up the ceilings so it was really big cavernous kind of kind of space and then they had the downstairs club which i may have gone down there once it was like there was no reason to go down there. Nothing was. I mean, something was going on. I don't know what it was. I never went down there. Yeah, I've been in there one time when I was younger, in the uh, late, early, probably early nineties, and it was the bigger. You know, you had upstairs. You know, like a. Yeah. It was more like a balcony. You had a balcony, and then you had the stage down. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And the dressing room. The dressing rooms were above the stage, up above and behind. So when you came out of the dressing room, there was stairs that went down either side. So. And that's how our singer would always come on. And a lot of guys did that. Singers, but they would start up on the top, come out of the dressing room with the wireless mic and work their way down to the stage. Gotcha. And uh, I, have a, I have a video of us, October of 88 at the at Gazaris. And there's so many people come up on stage. John Karabi is on stage with us. Um, who else? God, there's a bunch of different people that all just came up on stage, like our, our last song. Yeah. And we knew John, John, John had a band called Angora that were pretty popular i guess and um so it's it was funny because we were still really establishing ourselves at that point you know we were getting to the headlining status but a lot of bands had huge followings mm -hmm. um or they didn't <clears throat> excuse me and so we were just getting to that level and we had a, a my, the singer and i but our birthday is the same day february 8th mm -hmm. and we had a party at our apartment that uh february of 88 mm -hmm. and brett michaels was there uh the warrant guys were there and because they'd gotten something all the stuff and so it was like we kind of arrived we knew we were like we were happening now because of the, these guys had the respect for us to show up to our party you know kind of thing right, which right. was so this is a you know, like late 80s right yeah 88 getting into 89 when it was real we were i mean in my band in particular we were really hitting hard and doing all that stuff and really pursuing Warner brothers and Ted Dumpman and, and all that stuff. And in fact, uh, getting talking about our drummer, he somehow got involved with Ted's limo driver and was feeding him tapes. So we were like trying to circumvent Barry Squire and go directly to Ted and all that stuff. And mm -hmm. it was just, it was really funny, all the stuff that you would get involved with. And so, so at the time, you know, when I'm, when I'm going back to 88, um, by this point, Van Halen is literally like on the Monsters of Rock tour, and 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 yeah. also Dawkins was on that tour. You know, I, I grew up with Lynch and with with Eddie as my two of my primary influences. Um, and they, and you know, going back in their history, their seventies kind of guys, all from the Starwood and all of the Randy Rhodes and all that area era. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Had Craig Leon on here; he was from that era and played. Oh yeah, 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 yeah and played out there and still out there. But yeah, so you, what was your, your visibility of Van Halen at the time you were in the clubs? You just, they were just out on the road most of the time. I was they, were, they were on the road. And it's funny because, you know, like I had mentioned to you one time before, it's like in Texas, everyone has a Willie Nelson story. Yeah. So if you're in the music business in LA, in some capacity, everybody has an Eddie Van Halen story. Right, right. And a sighting. It was always like, did you see Ed? I saw Ed, you know, kind of thing. Right, right, he was just right. driving by, you know, and I would, that's kind of how it always was. It was like, I sort of... I think there was that his Lamborghini right. or, uh, or you see him in the, and later on that uh, his striped truck that he had, I remember seeing him on Ventura Boulevard in his striped truck. Right. right. And it was like, Holy shit, you know, but um, yeah, so they really weren't around 
you know, but I mean, if you want to get to the first time I saw them, the yeah. band was on yeah. the Diver Down Tour. Yeah, where, where at? And, uh, at the Capitol, Cent uh, Capitol Center in Maryland. Yeah, you know, that, and that one on tape, that's on video. Yeah. And so my sister, I took my sister, I, was, I think uh, that was at 82, yeah, like, it was 16. Yeah. yeah. And it was open seating. We were down on the floor, like jamming ourselves right up in the front. Right, right. And I, that's kind of what got me, you know, I was already playing music at that point, you know, and stuff like, but with that time, I was like, this is it. You know, it's one of those moments where you hear people say, that's the moment where it, it all came together. This is my path. Exactly. Yeah. And because it was like, I couldn't believe what I had just seen. Right. Right. And just jumping ahead really quick. Um, uh, I don't know, 15 years ago, I was at the Pasadena, Pasadena city college swap meet. And there was a guy out there who had a box full of VHS tapes mm -hmm. from different concerts. Yeah. And I look in there, it's this Capitol Center Largo, 1982. What? Mm -hmm. I pull it out. It's that show. Right, right. So this is way before, you know, YouTube and stuff like that. And so I still have that VHS <clears throat> and I had transferred it to DVD and I still watch it. And and to this day, that's the best rock show I've ever seen. Right. I don't and know that, if it was and that, and that cool. That's so yeah. cool. That's good. It's cool that you have the show that you were at. In 80s, yeah. man, that's like, yeah, <laughs> I wasn't uh, because that was October, so Dave's birthday was, I think, the day before, okay. And so they did two nights, and I saw him the second night, so he, he had already had his birthday, the right show the night before, which would have been, I'm sure, it would have been insane to have seen right. that one, but um, right, there's a lot of talk yeah. about those uh, the Capitol Center shows and how they recorded those, you know, because kids, yeah. kids have been recorded there that's out there, and then you've got. They say there's the 81 show and maybe even the 80 show for Van Halen were recorded there, but haven't been unleashed yet. Yeah, because yeah, because the Capitol Center had this one of the first uh, venues that had those giant screens and it was for hockey and basketball and stuff like that. So it's like it was you, you could see it. I mean, it was these giant screen televisions you know, all the way around. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so there were they filmed everything there, just which was cool. You know, I, I mean, I thought it was just broadcast just for the event, but um, I mean, it's cool that they taped it. They're, uh, they're out there somewhere. Somebody they're said that they used to offer it to the bands as like a service. They would, you know, they could pay an extra whatever and get the tapes. Yeah, is what they said. But, but yeah, man. So eighty two, it changed your life. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you know that's what? I, kind of it all. It all just started. It focused. Everything came together, and that's that was the. Yeah, the Don Kirsch, Don Kirshner's videos, you know, the ones with the '81 tour. That, that's what mm -hmm. I saw. That changed, kind of changed my whole my life. Yeah. And uh, I think it was just, you know, he was so different and so ahead of his time. You know, we did, people take it for granted now because there's so many people that yeah play like that these days. But but he was the like he, really before that it was Ace Freely. I mean, you know that that was right. kind of like the technical yeah. wizardry of guitar. You know, maybe yeah. I'm sure there were other people that were very technical. You know, I, I when I think of people of that era that were technical, I think of people that I saw on TV, which were like the the Hee Haw guys. You know, Roy Clark. You know, oh, yeah. those guys could Blank shred. Ball. You know, yeah, yeah they, they, they were, were the, the actual real. They were the first shredders. Right. You know? The first, yeah, the first technicians, right? And uh, right. but, yeah, but when Van Halen came along, he was the rock version of that, and and uh, that's when it connected with me, and obviously millions of other people, and you. Mm -hmm. So you're you're out in L.A. and you start having these interactions with Ed um, that end up with you being at a rehearsal. Kind of run me through, you know, that whole path with you. Some of the things sure, that happened. Sure. Um, the first, so again, I mean, I had these kind of like sightings and for years, you know, it's like, you'd hear things, Ed's here and Ed's there. A friend of mine, just back in real quick, lived downstairs from us in the Van Nuys apartment. This guy, Steve Alponi. Steve was, I think friends with somebody in Val's family, maybe her brother or something. And he bought Ed's motorcycle. Ed had a Honda Rebel, a little 250 Honda Rebel. And so it was like, it was one of those things like, oh my God. And so the whole time I've been in LA, it's always been some kind of little something that was, you know, it would always keep that, that, I don't know, that thing going, you know, in your head mm -hmm. that one day, maybe I'll meet Ed one day, you know, I'm this I, close. I know somebody who bought his motorcycle. I'm that close, you know, right, right. Cause Ed had learning to ride a motorcycle. So jumping forward to 91, my friend Joe who had moved out here with us 
was had ended up going on tour with bands and became this big sound engineer, traveled the world. So in 91, they were rehearsing at a place called Schubert Sound, the powerhouse over in North Hollywood. And I knew they were there and because Joe had told me, he's like, hey, you know, Van Halen's in. I'm like, oh, what's it like? And he goes, oh, they're super cool. Because that's Sammy was singing and stuff. And he goes, you should come down. Because if I can arrange it, you know, you should come down. I'm like, yeah, that'd be fucking awesome. <laughs> right, right, right. And so one day, because that must have been the summer of eight, of 91, I guess, right before that tour. And so Joe's like, uh, White Line is in the front room on the right when you come in the door. Michael McDonald was re- rehearsing like next door to them. And then Van Halen is to the left in the big room. And I'm like, okay, cool. So he goes, so I'll let you know when to come down and where to go. So we, he calls, he's working there. I go, our ba- actually our whole band went down there. We all went down there expecting to hang out with Van Halen, which didn't happen okay. initially. So we're out just shooting in the parking lot there. They had a basketball hoop. So we're out just playing basketball. But we can hear them playing, they're rehearsing. And then all of a sudden it's silent. And out comes Sammy, out comes Mike. And they're just shooting the shit. They end up, we all play basketball together <laughs> with Mike and Sammy. We're playing, I suck at basketball. So I'm over here, guys, it's me. You know, come on, throw me the ball. No. <laughs> but, so we all, we're all playing basketball. I mean, it's one of those like surreal, you know, LA kind of things. Michael McDonald comes out with a birthday cake. It's his birthday. He's like, hey, you guys want some birthday cake? So we ate, we played basketball with Sammy and Mike. We ate birthday cake with Michael McDonald. And you can hear White Lion rehearsing. And I see Ed come out and he's standing like in the, when you go into the front door, there's like this big open area and he's just standing there and he's kind of goofing on those guys because of Vito. I mean, Vito was great, right, right. but he was, you know, you're in you know, what was Ed's quotes? Like you steal a guy's car and you bring it back to his house and say, Hey, check out my new car. <laughs> and so right. it was kind of like that. So like he's in there doing his thing and Eddie's standing outside the door. You know, but then he disappears. And and so I asked Joe, I said, well, you know, I'm like, can I, you know, I had left and gone to the liquor store. I came back and he's like, OK, they're taking a break. I'll let you know when you can go in. Actually, my brother was there, too. He had already gone while well, I was gone. Him and our drummer, my brother was there. He went, they went in. They met Ed. And Ed had just got the Ernie Ball guitars. He had the purple one and that honey blonde one. And so he was bummed that my brother was is a painter he was like you don't play guitar and my brother's got hair down you know it looked like sebastian bach had this really long straight hair and ed was like well what about you to the drummer he goes well i'm a drummer I'm like, can, I, can i meet al but al had taken off as well and so i get back i'm the door's closed i'm looking through a little porthole like this you could see ed in there hmm. and i was like okay it's it's cool you know so we can go in and like my heart's going you know like this I'm sweating you know. Finally, finally, your LA moment is happening. You, you. Yeah, uh, after all these years, I've been here since '87. I've seen him lots of times in places, and know people that know people, and all that crap. You know, and so it's like, hey, you know, Joe's like, Ed, this is my buddy Nelson. And he's like, hey, man, what's going? On? Cool, cool. And Joe believes there are other people in the room. It's a big, big room. They had the full stage set up in there, it, but it was they were. I believe they were set up on the floor, so it wasn't like on an actual stage. Right, right. <clears throat> but it was the full tour rig. You know? And he was just more excited to show me these two guitars, like a guitar player. Mm-hmm. You know, check this out. Look at it. And he was like, you know, it was like a little kid. Like, check it out. And it's like, and he was asking me, you know, I mean, I was in there, I don't know, it was 20 minutes. That would have been a lifetime. Mm-hmm. But, you know, he was just asking me about what I do. And I was like, well, you know, I'm a guitar player. Yeah. And you know, what do you play? And we're like, we're kind of like an Aerosmith. I didn't want to say Van Halen. You know, it's like, well, we're kind of like an Aerosmithy kind of hard rock band. So that's cool. And then, like I mentioned to you, I think in a message, like I did not want him to ask me to play. Right. Because right, that, right. that would be the worst thing ever. I would have just gone, conk, conk. I mean, I wouldn't have been able to do anything. So, right. um, but he was super cool. I mean, it was, and it's funny because people that I know that have known him or knew him, they would always say there's two different Eddie Van Halens. Mm-hmm. There's that guy. And then the one I met years later, right, right, which right. was the other Ed. Right. Right. And, and, but he was, couldn't have been cooler. was super nice. I mean, again, it was like, you know, I didn't, I, I, I may have just made myself leave just like, okay, I gotta go because it was just, it was, you know, too much. I don't know. Almost too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
right, right. <clears throat> almost too much because it's like he's just a guy who has a cool cool job i mean but you know since 1978 right you've been staring at this guy in magazines and the records and you know <clears throat> excuse me going to the concert that like sent you here essentially sure to, sure. to la you know that kind of thing right. and so it's like okay well i, I gotta go now <laughs> Well, you know, I, that was it. I, I've told this story on here a few times because I, I, this is a funny story about Ed, but my uh, buddy that toured with Ed in 95, when he came back from that tour, uh, it took me a while because he was always busy to get with him and actually ask him about this right, first, right. First interaction with Ed when he was on tour for, I want to say they were out with it for six weeks or something. But uh, I said, so what was he like? And he goes, oh, man, he was just a really cool regular dude. And I looked at him and I was like, what did you just say? I said, bro. He's not a regular dude. He's not a I, I said, dude, that is the guy that played guitar on Van Halen 1. What are you talking about? Man? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, a lot of people, you know, and, and myself, even when I met him, you know, briefly in uh, 2015, he was super warm, man. He was very, um, and it, we've talked about this on here a bunch, that he has this way of, separating himself from that poster guy you know the guy that you right, right somehow he just once you're with him you you forget it yeah and i mean being in la and being around movie business and lots of famous people it's like it's initially it's a it's kind of like oh my god i can't believe it's so and so right, right um until you're around them for a little bit and then it's kind of like it wears off like when i first became friends with lemmy yeah. it's like because I was working as a freelance photographer and I was shooting him for a magazine. And you're like, oh, crap. It's, I mean, Lemmy is like, you know, yeah, Lemmy right. is God. It's, you know, it's like, right, you know, right. and, but he was the coolest person ever. And so he would, you know, we'd hang out at the Rainbow. It's like we went to a couple parties with him and he was always get, trying to get me to hook him up with black girls. And <laughs> it's like, hey, man, you, you know, you know, so-and-so, can you hook me up? And they're like, that's weird. That's a weird question, you know, but, but it was like, I, and it's funny because you have these fantasies like, I'm going to become friends with Eddie Van Halen. You know, it's like, obviously that was never going to happen. But it's like, what would my relationship be with, like if that were to happen? Because, you know, later on, it's like, you know, I played with Billy Ray Cyrus and it's like one of those things. And it's like, you know, you start Miley, you get around these people and you're kind of like, you know, it just all that novelty of them being who they are kind of wears off. And it's like, they're just cool people. Right, right. And so I was hoping right. I was, but again, you know, they always say about, you know, meeting your, your idols or your heroes and the disappointment that can, that can happen. come with that. Yeah. Because you have a certain idea of who they are and right. then they, then they become human and then you're like, nah, you know, right. So I was kind of glad I never really had that much interaction with them. Um, especially in the later points when he was having a having a hard time. I mean, you did, you did, you were at the rehearsal in 2004 and we, we embraced that. I mean, you know, obviously we all know that he was struggling and I, I saw the tour. I mean, I, I saw the tour and yeah. you, you had mentioned to me in one of the um, emails back and forth that you were at the rehearsal in 2004. And you sent me this picture of this guitar pick that he played eruption with, right? Hold on. <laughs> yeah. Right. Here. right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, Edward. Yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah, I was going to say before you say that, because I wanted to set it up, is when I saw him in 2004, it was in um, Louisville, Kentucky. And I was real close. Mm -hmm. I was probably four rows back. And um, overall, it, it was a fine, it was a good show. He wasn't really, really bad that night in any particular way. But I will say when he did Eruption that night, for some reason, that particular night, you know, I've seen him do this live so many times, that he was on fire that night. And I'm not sure what it was, man, but there was something about that particular version, that particular night, you know, that I just, right. like you said, uh, it was like, he, it was 78 and I was watching it, you know? Yeah. I was, I was well, seeing, seeing that part, you know? Right, right. So I mentioned to you that my my buddy Bob Dixon, the amp guy, had done used to do work for Michael Anthony. Yeah. Uh, amp techs. Bob had been to fifty one fifty, and he played Ed's Frankenstein guitar, and and he would tell me stuff. You know, that I'll keep confidential. You know, but um, I heard some crazy shit. Right, right. And and um, so 
that year. So that was 2004. That uh, I think that was in June or whatever when that tour started. Right. right. Because I remember May, at the end of May, Bob says, "Hey, man, I'm going to the Forum. I, I have to drop off an amp for Madonna's guitar player. She, Madonna's playing at the Forum. Do you want to go?" I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll go. Well, I thought I was going to go backstage and hang out. Well, I got a ticket, and Bob was like, "I'll see you later." So I went and sat in the Forum and watched Madonna for two hours. <laughs> and, and I came out and I was like, dude, I thought I was going to get to hang, you know? And he's like, no, I'm sorry. I just want to know if you want to go. I'm like, all right, thanks. I got to see Madonna. Cool. <laughs> so literally a week or so later, he calls me. He says, dude, I, I, I you know, I got to make up for taking you to Madonna and leaving you there. He goes, you want to go to Van Halen rehearsal? I got I to drop off a couple amps for Mike. I'm like, uh, yeah, that would be, would be cool. <clears throat> and so they were rehearsing at Sony Studios over in Call the City. And so we go down there and go in the on the sound stage. They did have a stage set up, but it was really low. I mean, probably only a couple of feet high. But the full rig, I mean, it was the tour was going to start the next week. Yeah, I was going to say, so you, we, you had mentioned earlier about that when you saw them in 91 that they had they were on the floor. I and, believe they were set up on the floor. Yeah, yeah. they were. And, and what, what reason I'm saying that is because I watched this uh, thing with the entire crew. There was a video that they put up a few years ago in 2020. And they explained why they did that because the, apparently the rigging couldn't fit. Wouldn't fit. Yeah. yeah. At, at, Schubert, at, at right. Schubert Sound. Well, Schubert Sound was at that that uh, place. Schubert Sound was the, the, the pro audio concert uh, stuff. And then Powerhouse was the rehearsal studio. Yeah. And so it essentially was just big, nice, really nice room. So, but it was, it was interesting that they would come in there and rehearse there, but Janet right. Jackson was rehearsing there and lots of people. Um, yeah, go ahead. Me back to well, 2004. So door opens up, we go in, they're already playing. Um, it, I think it was the air where Ed was never wearing a shirt. Right. It was ratty, ratty ass jeans, the boots with the duct tape, the whole thing. Right, it was right. just like everything you'd see with, and there he is. And he's playing and him and Mike are standing together. I remember specifically seeing them standing together. Eddie's, I don't remember what song they were playing, but Mike kept going, it goes to A, it goes to A. Mm -hmm. Because Eddie was like, he didn't even know how the song went with anymore. It's like, what is going on? The tour is next week. And Mike's standing there with the bass going, it goes to A right here. It's A. And then so that, you know, I was like, what is going on? I mean, that was kind of, I was like taken aback by like, what is going on here? I mean, it's like, this is a this is a mess. It's right. this whole thing looks is a shit show. And so they take a break, and then Eddie just is up there, and then Al is still behind the drums, and all of a sudden, just out of nowhere, Al does brruh, brruh, and he go into it. And it was again, I was standing 10 feet from Eddie. Mm-hmm. In this again, the platform, the stage was a couple feet high, but I'm he's like right there. I mean, I could have threw a, my chewing gum at him and hit him. Right. They go into, into eruption, and again, it was like I closed my eyes, and it was like listening to the first record. It was flawless. And he didn't go into the whole cathedral and all all that extra stuff. He just essentially just did eruption. Right, right. And I was like, I mean, I'm like getting chills right now thinking about it, because it was like, that was, I mean, like, I don't know, like seeing Beethoven, dun, 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 actually right. do it, you know? Right, and, right. Um, and so they get finished. He puts his guitar down. He walks over to me and he's coming off the stage. And he jumps down and he goes, you look like a guitar player. And he just throws this pick at me. And I'm like, fuck, yeah, I'm a guitar player, but you just played Eruption with this pick. <laughs> and so you know, I have it. But I mean, that was that was, it was really weird. I remember him going, you look like a guitar player. And he just kind of, he didn't throw it at me, but he just kind of like, I was starting to hold my hand out because he had it like in his hand like this and he just kind of tossed it and I caught yeah. it. So. And then off he went and that was well, the last time I ever I saw him, you know. Well, you know what? There is this thing, you know, like guitar players, no guitar players. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know oh, I, I, I can I, look yeah. out in the audience and go, that guy's a guitar player. <laughs> yeah, totally, just, totally. just by watching But them. in complete, complete contrast to that, mm-hmm. Um, it's funny because I remember the, the, the months of things I think was because of something else that has happened. So March of 2007, Ed had just gotten out of rehab Mm -hmm. and I was living in studio city just down the hill from where his house is and ringside liquors, liquor store is a corner of Witsit and Riverside right there or Moore park. I can't remember exactly what street is, but around the corner. 
I stopped in there and I pulled up next to this badass BMW that's blacked out windows and just tricked. I'm like, oh, wow, that's a cool car. <clears throat> I go in the liquor store, I'm getting whatever, and I'm walking up to the counter and I walk up behind him and I knew it was him immediately. Mm-hmm. And his hair was short. Uh, he was wearing a white tank top, these white kind of like parachute pants that only went to the knees, white tinge. I can still see him like he's standing in front of me. Uh, it was really tan. Mm-hmm. And, I, and he was kind of standing like a little bit of three quarter. So I could see the side of his face. I'm like, God damn, Ed looks good. I mean, he, he only came up. I mean, I'm six feet tall. His head came up to about here on me. Yeah. <clears throat> and I was like, damn, he looks good. <clears throat> Excuse me. He had just, you know, he just got out of rehab and he was in really good shape. And I mean, he, he had the new teeth. I mean, he looked because the last time I'd seen Ed was the one you see in all those pictures where he's like screaming and his hair is long and gray and his teeth are missing, yeah. which was depressing to see that, you know. Sure. <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So I felt really good for him that he, but I looked down and he's standing there, he's holding two bottles of wine. I'm like, why is he in a liquor store with two bottles of wine? He just got a rehab. I mean, I know he doesn't have that much self control, but like, I don't know. And he paid for his stuff and psh, that was his car and he sped out of there and he was gone, you know, I'm like, and that's yeah. so. We know what happened. Then, I mean, he get he got you know. Eventually, he had a couple little more relapses or whatever, and then he he managed to get out of the hole. Yeah. And that was the that was a you know I think oh eight you know we saw I saw him in tour on those tours in oh seven oh eight, um, and then you know he made this amazing like recovery in twenty twelve and twenty fifteen you know and right. saw him in twenty fifteen for the first time outside man and his tone was unbelievably good man i was yeah. like I don't, I don't maybe it was just being outside <laughs> you know his sound so is so huge and trying to do that in a arena can be trouble yeah but uh yeah, and the, i saw him again the last time i actually saw him live was 2012 right. was the rehearsal for that that tour the 2012 oh. tour with dave yeah. um and they were rehearsing at the forum and they had the full light rig, the whole thing set up, and it was like a dress rehearsal. I mean, they were getting days away from leaving for for that tour, right. and they, you know, they were all wearing their stage clothes and stuff. And that's the first time I ever saw Wolfie live, and and that's how I actually, again, like knowing people that know people, I got down there for that because a friend of mine, his wife worked for a property management company who was renting a house to Wolfie, okay. and so hey, if you guys want to come down and see a rehearsal, come on down, put you on the list. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and so they ended up not going, so they just they sent me down there. I'm like, and it was cool. I mean, they would do like ten seconds of a song, and then the three guys would jam, and Dave would walk off, and and then they would come out, and Dave would jump, and go, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, and you know, and just kind of was kind of just going through the cues, and and they sounded great. Yeah, uh, yeah. Was, it was really, yeah, it was Wolfgang, really good. Wolfgang did a really good job. I saw and met him in twenty. 20- 2010, I think it was. He came through with uh, Mark Tremonti when he was doing. Oh yeah, yeah. And he played a little right, bit right. place in Birmingham. And um, afterwards, they were like, "If you buy any merchandise, you can hang out, and meet the band." It's like, yeah, I'll cool. buy, buy merchandise anyway. So yeah, we talked to him, and he was super cool, man. And he, you know, he, I know he's kind of on this thing where he's trying to really establish himself. But he, but at the time, anyway, <laughs> um, before his bad dad passed, he was very. He's a big fan of his dad's legacy even though he oh yeah, yeah. He, he's he's not, not really really wanting to talk about it now but but that you know especially when he was alive very knowledgeable of everything the fans like mm-hmm. and want and uh you know he was all about the uh well he knew about the videos that everybody wanted those videos and you know he's gone to his dad about all these things i expect it one day that he will you know kind of open the vaults and and uh Right. Give everybody the things that they want, but like you, like he, you know, he's still recovering from his dad's loss, obviously, and uh, it's gonna take some time. But but he's doing good. He's doing real good. I've seen him like uh, I've seen him three or four times now live, and he's he's gotten better every time. Yeah, that record when his record came out, and it's like you know they did the first song, you know, it was the distance, and then started hearing the next thing, and the next like, damn, every song was like this song. This guy's a monster. Everything, drum. I mean, he's a phenomenal drummer. Oh, yeah. And the yeah. bass, the vocals, and they're like, whoa, man. It's like the guitar is the least of it almost. It's like songwriter. It's like, Jesus, it's talk about in the blood. Yeah, and man. Eddie, for you, just said, you wait till you hear Wolfie's record. This guy is going to blow your mind. And like, he was not kidding and he wasn't, you know, exaggerating because it was his son. I mean, it was like, 
holy shit, this is great. Yeah, Wolfgang, you know? he is he's an incredible player. And you're right, he, he plays it all with the same, you know, the yeah. drums is like, you know, like he said, his first instrument, really. And, and but, right, he didn't right, play right, anyway, right. but but he came to my town and the, when he came here to Huntsville um, the day before, I think he, he injured his foot and he couldn't mm -hmm. play. He couldn't he couldn't stand. <laughs> so oh, he had no. to he had to sit the whole show with a, with a thing on his leg, <laughs> like Dave Grohl style. And Dave Grohl. Yeah, that's hardcore right there. That's hardcore. <laughs> and he did he did it, man. It was awesome. He did a great show and uh, got some great shots of him with this thing on his leg. <laughs> and he had the wolf. He had the uh, mammoth sticker on it and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. cool. But that's yeah, really, really cool. Good guy. I mean, I really think he's a good guy. I think that you know, it, it's it's obviously a bitch being being this the son of somebody so famous that right. uh, and so many people you know like uh, somebody said not long ago that. Ed hated how people hung on everything he did. You know, like everything he did, everybody was just so, they mm -hmm. just were all about what, it didn't matter if it was the very act or whatever. You know, there's just so many fans are so just crazy about it. And I, I'm one of those people, but you know how that can be for somebody like him. He's having to, you know, now feel all of that. And uh, I think he's just trying to take some time and, and get his get his life together and do his thing. And Right. Yeah. You know, it's funny, it's like, um, I don't know, really know of another guitar player that other guitar players are so obsessed with knowing everything about. Yeah, I mean, how many video channels are of like the tone and the pickup and the, the string and the what the weather was like that day to get that sound and you know and all that stuff. And it's like it's just it's amazing the how deep you know I've watched some of these video. I can't remember some of these guys' names where it's like you know talking about the different capacitor that was in probably in the amp at that time and the this then it's like man it's like that's yeah. cool but i mean it's there's rabbit hole stuff for sure you know there's, yeah 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 and i've I been mean, up at one o'clock in the morning my wife's like what are you doing like well the guy's talking about the this and the that and i'm like and she's like <laughs> my, wife, my wife says you're obsessed that's what she says you're just obsessed mm -hmm. uh, you know and when I, I, it, well, go ahead and I, you know, I started this whole video thing because the the channel. Well, I, I had the channel before doing interviews with just musicians and their kind mm -hmm. of their career path. But I kept running across people, obviously, that like me that had these stories about Ed, and um, or yourself who who had been directly in contact with. Him. But yeah, I, you know, there's a lo so much lore around yeah. le lore and legend because th these guys didn't. Put it out there you know they they like they intentionally <laughs> mis misdirected and did things that that i think a lot of it was very intentional sure sure that's and that was dave's genius yeah. was like let you know never get in the way of a good rumor let people think what they want it's like as long as they're thinking who cares right you get yeah. in their head right you get in your head and they stay in their head and that and that's true and it really you know one of the things i uncovered that i, I just got a confirmation on and there's been a few that i've run across that i'm like that can't be true but but you know like they never told anything so um one of them was the pasadena civic a lot of people think that they played in the auditorium there and um when the reality is they played in the exhibition center in their ex expo hall those were all the Next shows. And no, none of the shows were in the exhibition. None of them were in the actual auditorium, even though it said they were. Right, and right. and I was also told that it wasn't. They they were saying something like uh, twelve or fourteen shows there, and it was more like six. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> so in yeah. terms, of I've, I've heard that too. That there was you know, um, not as many shows as they made it sound like. Right. <laughs> you know, and you know, being you were there in the in the in the late eighties, and and I was there, and you know, perception is a huge part of what what you when you're selling something. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and 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 I kind of knew that in my head that they were probably it was, everything was a little either overinflated or there was some lore behind it that wasn't exactly what you know. And I kind of knew that. But what's cool about this channel is finding out things like that. Like oh yeah, and um, I've seen a couple of your videos. Like people that were there at that time, like yeah. Greg Leon. It's like there at that time, right? You know, it's like, so. And I have a a guy I played with this guy named Ray Wolf, and Ray was out here too. And he was like, oh, I used to see Van Halen the whiskey all the time. I'm like, but I don't think they played the whiskey as much as people think they played there because they were. They were uh, San Gabriel, Pasadena. That's where their following was. Because I, another guy I've met a few years back said, 
they were talking about the quiet riot. I mean, I've heard a lot of that quiet riot Van Halen rivalry. Well, there, he says there was none because quiet riot was a Hollywood band and Van Halen was a that, you know, East Valley, you know, going into Pasadena, going that direction band. And that's so when I Van Halen would come, that's why I can't, yeah, when Van Halen would play Hollywood, it's like they didn't have a following in Hollywood. It's like that legendary Starwood show where Ted's there. There was nobody there. Right, 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 right. Have you, have you ever talked to Doug Messenger? You know who Doug Messenger is? Yeah, I know who he is. And I know, you know, I've seen his videos where he did some interviews with Sunset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so Doug was like, I was there that night. There was no one there. It was me, the bartender. And then Ted comes in with Mo Austin later on. He's like, and there's Van Halen, you know, uh, doing Van Halen, you know, which is crazy. So, right, and that's right. what I had heard too. It's like they were, you know, they may have been the house band at Gazaris, but that was mid 70s. And so later on, it's like, I think even they were kind of like, what's going to happen here? I mean, is this ever going to happen? Because playing clubs, you know, being a cover band for five years or something or four or five years, that's a long time to be a cover band hoping something's going to happen. Especially in the same room. It's really tough to stay in the same yeah, room. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Keep it going. Exactly. And, and especially when you've got the whole disco era happening in the middle of it. Yeah. You're trying to survive. Yeah, it. yeah, totally. It's I'm mad. sure it was frustrating. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's amazing. Yeah, and the Quiet Right thing, you know, they had a new documentary come out on Randy Rhodes, and I just posed mm-hmm. that question to uh, Mike Wolf, who was my last guest who's Pasadena native. And he said, man, there wasn't, there wasn't this rivalry that, that they're, you know, cause there were people yeah. on there going that I used to tape Eddie's face onto his wall pedal and he would stomp on it. And I'd be like, I don't know, man. I, I, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I, I totally doubt that. that. sounds pretty, pretty wild. But then I know I will say this, that Chris Holmes said there was, you know, that, that they couldn't like jump camps is how he put it. You know, like you were either a van. Yeah. I mean, I could see that. And, and uh, the uh, legendary Glendale College show at that auditorium. In fact, I mean, I live all around all that stuff. Right, right. And so I drive by that place every single day, taking my kids you know, up to school, up to summer camp. And um, it's across the street from Glendale College. I don't know if originally it was a part of the college, but it's it's a standalone building across the street. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, 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 I'm talking every day when I go past there, I think about them. Every single day, I think about Quiet Riot and Van Halen. What must have been going on inside that building that night? That both those bands were there. It must have been yeah. crazy. Craig Leon was uh, on here, and he was there. He was at that show, and he and he accident. Yeah. It was sort of an accident that he ended up at it. Uh, he had a friend who who was the janitor over there, and he just kind of like saved them two seats in the front. And they came, came in, and he had no idea about Van Halen. He had nothing, you know. He knew about Quiet Riot, and you know, of course. And blew him blew his mind but he had actually run across them you know they had been at his shows and things and he didn't really realize it was them and then he goes to this show and, mm-hmm. and he goes those are the guys that are at my show yeah. <laughs> van halen yeah so, so yeah was, was, i don't was that 77 i think so yeah. You were there, yeah. 77. 77, yeah yeah so it's it, interesting with like van halen how everything happened in 77 it yep. seems like yeah I agree. and we you talked know, about even that. like with Ed doing eruption. It's like if I and it's funny, I was standing in front of him having a conversation with him. The one thing I I should have asked him that I've always would have asked him, how did you come up with the tap the eruption? Because timelines and everybody talks about the, you know, the, the Van Halen geeks, like when did Ed do that? Because they went to Sunset Sound and he recorded it mm-hmm. just as a goof initially. But everyone that I run across in all these years said he wasn't doing any of that stuff back then. Sure. At the, at the clubs and he was doing eruption like a solo, but not the tapping part. It's like, sure. well, what, did that just happen one day? And all of a sudden they went to the studio and, and put it on the record? I mean, yeah, you know, you know what we've been able to figure out anyway. And, and, you know, I've gone through this with a lot of people exactly this question because because the di- bootlegs, especially Mike Wolf. Who, who had collected all of the bootlegs. And that's how he ended up with Eddie Van Halen. Um, the bootlegs show him playing that late. It looks like late 77 was the first time. Um, right. And then, and this is when the record's being recorded, you know, October right, right. Was, uh, of 77 came out in February. But it just seems like, you know, there's this discussion. Greg Renoff's a friend of mine, and he did that book on Van Halen. And yeah, yeah. it seems like, from what we can tell, they all had a little bit of time when Ted Templeman got engaged with them. Um, the impression, if I can't remember exactly, but it seemed like they wanted them to ease up on the gigs, maybe. 
And right. and Roth went and got vocal lessons. We know that's that happened. And, right, right, right. And, and I we kind of think that maybe Eddie had time too, and he and he'd run across. What shit it? Yeah. He wanted run across this with uh, Chris Holmes and um, how, the Howie Mandel thing. George Lynch says that right. him and Eddie were at the same show for Canned Heat, where he, they both saw tapping. Mm. And um, someday I'm going to get Lynch on here and we're get it out of him, you know, get more of these details about that because he was there. Right, right. But, uh, yeah, apparently that was a very, like, last-minute ad before the album. And then all yeah. of a sudden, you know, he's this Eddie Van Halen that we know for the rest of his career, you know. That just like, literally just like that. I mean, it's like he was Ed, which was phenomenal, and then all of a sudden he just catapulted to some other stratosphere that just literally overnight. Seemed like it, right? You know, there, yeah, and it's funny because the two questions, I mean, it's like all these years I've read all the magazines, all the stuff. So it's really nothing. It's like, what would you what would you ask Eddie Van Halen or David Lee Roth? I mean, what would you ask them about anything? Mm-hmm. The only two questions I would ever have was, Ed, how'd you do? What, where did eruption come from in the, the way it's recorded? And mm-hmm. Dave, when did you first do the splits off the drum riser? Because you didn't do it on the first tour. So at some time it happened, I guess, because because it's on the second the album cover on the second for the second record right he broke his foot and yeah he broke his foot <laughs> right. yeah, yeah yeah so it's like well how did that even come to be and you know, when did you do that those are, those would be like the questions that you know I'd have and it's funny yeah. Dave I have Dave stuff on you know peripheral associations you know with with Dave just from being around out here too and I mean speaking of you know since I sell real estate I sold a house down the street a block over from Dave's house yeah. And one of the, the people that were buying it, you know, I said, hey, you know, David Roth lives right up right the street. And they're like, what? You know, yeah, he comes out and he jogs and stuff like that. I mean, I was, I'd never saw him, but, you know, right. I just, I'd heard that. Right. And so they were like, they were was blown away about, you know, wow, David Lee Roth lives right there. And it's like, I mean, you're never going to see him, but sure, he lives right over there. Yeah, right. You know, and that's an interesting thing about Pasadena in that in that area is that, you know, if you know Lost Lowness and the street that the Van Halen's grew up on and you go yeah. over to Bradford where, where Roth is, the difference in world. the difference in their worlds growing up was, you know, far and wide. Yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, I, it just seems like, you know, there's a, this discussion I had it was a couple back on, on one of these where uh, they were talking about this guy who lived at Ross house, who was uh, this little audiophile guy that they let live in the guest house, even after they moved in. Mm-hmm. And um, he had like one of those turntables that was hanging from the ceiling, like, so it wouldn't vibrate, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. And apparently Eddie said, I wanted to kick that turntable every time I saw it. And, and the point was that, that he was not, you know, he didn't have those kind of toys, I think, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's kind of yeah, what I he mean. Was. And it's interesting that Dave has never left that house. Yeah, it is. I mean, I mean, it's beautiful, yeah. huge. Um, I've seen his gate open a few times to drive him, you know, when I've gone down his street and I've seen his Mercury back there in the, in the carport thing that he has. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like, you know, get a little chill, like, wow, that's, you know, there's his Mercury, his red Mercury, you know, it's like kind of thing. And, yeah. but, you know, I've always wanted to, like when Greg, and I know Greg, and when Greg's book came out, I was telling Greg, I said, I'm going to take a copy and just zing it over his wall, over the fence and see if he gets it and, leave my business card in it or something. <laughs> so he calls me like, what the hell is this? You know, why are you bothering me? Yeah. You know, there's a, uh, the last, the, the last person on, uh, was over at Eddie's house and he took two copies of the book to Eddie and he gave them to him. Right. And, yeah. uh, he also sat down and watched a documentary on Van Halen with Eddie. It was, oh, wow. a, it was a Palladia documentary that came out maybe five years ago. And, uh, at the end I said, well, what did he, what did he say about the documentary? And he goes, I live that man. I live that old story. And then he said, I gave him the books for Gre- from Greg, these two books, one for him, his brother and one for him. And he said, he set the books down. And he goes, I don't have to read that. I already, I already lived that story. <laughs> yeah, I was already there. I know. Yeah. yeah but but I, I tell you what, there's a lot of stuff in that book. He will never remember because Greg went far and wide and deep in that book. And, and uh, I, I really think that, you know, Greg, it, someday maybe they'll be able to pull some of that information together and do a full length documentary maybe or something because you know the eagles have their great documentary and you know there's a lot oh, yeah. of fantastic documentaries that are out van halen really deserves one it's just whether or not they ever want to get behind it and I, let it uh, yeah it's another, another interesting thing like with that and everybody knows this like why are they so why has everything been so tight-lipped secretive 
um, having something like Dave in the band where everything is, you know, over the top, but I guess it's, you know, it's you get to see what they want you to see. Sure. Instead of, you know, what's, what's reality. I mean, I don't know. It's just it, the behind the scenes, if there was such a thing, you know, you could ever get into that would, it's far more interesting, you know, we're just, I yeah, know, you know, they did that. They did that, you know. they did that little DVD thing that they added on to the different kind of truth thing where they went through some of their old stories, you know, talking about like yeah. how they got ripped off in the beginning, you know, how, how, you know, they were charged for the necklaces that they got for gifts. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Typical record company. The, yeah, yeah. Right, right. All your typical trappings mm -hmm. of the record company business. But, uh, and they got into it very lightly into it in a little bit of the, of the history. But man, they have really never. Other than what Jeff Hausman did on Van, you know, the Van Halen News Desk in his early years DVD, right, and right, that, right. that's really the only thing that's out there that's that uh, had any association with the band in any way. You know, yeah. th those guys have always had a relationship with the band all the way back, but before you know, we had DVDs. But yeah. Uh, yeah, man, it would be great to, to have uh, Wolfgang or, or Alex or both of them to get together and. and you know, the, the whole thing on that last interview I did, they were talking about releasing the, the bootlegs as a record. Mm -hmm. And um, they didn't cool. do it, but they were about to. And mm -hmm. that kind of gave me a little hope. But then Mike was like, he asked them about the video. Why don't you put some video or some behind the scenes? And he said they were not into that at all. And I, I think mm -hmm. that all goes back to Roth. I think they, they Roth and him, they had sort of have that, thing where one they can't ever agree on anything they can't ever get him to sign off on anything and, and that's kind of right. what i got and there was a new rolling stone article a guy had been communicating with eddie for the last six years yeah, of his life. Saw that. did you read that very similar yeah. story you know mike mike had mike and my other guest craig had, all three of those people the guy from rolling stone all three of them had had these parallel conversations with Eddie for six years around mm -hmm. during that time. And he pretty much said the same thing to all of them, that they just could not get on the same page with Roth about anything. They couldn't get him to yeah. go do anything. I don't know why Roth wasn't doing that, whether it's a health thing. There's the rumors that there's a health issue. Roth's come out and you know how Roth is. He'll, he's like the Riddler. He'll throw something oh, yeah. out there and go, you know. Uh, this might be my last tour. My doctor's this, my doctor's that. And then he doesn't say anything else. And then, of course, everybody, you know, just like you were saying, though, it's like they, they, they intentionally do this still, or at least Rob yeah. does. Your little carrots and get your, like, confu everyone confused and it's like, well, what the hell's going on here? <laughs> but it keeps you interested, I guess. I mean, you know. I guess it keeps you um, connected. But my, my, it's funny. I it was, it was just thinking about my first David Lee Roth encounter was mm -hmm. 1984 tour. And I was still living in Maryland and I went to see them at the Capitol Center with this other friend of mine. And the one just real quick, the one thing I noticed about the show compared to Diver Down 82 tour, you, you could see cracks. And I don't know if it was an off night or something, but the energy was different. I mean, they put on a good show. It was you know, they sounded great, but there was something about their their interaction, their energy with each other was different than what I had seen before. Sure. And then right after that is when it all was over. But the funny thing with I had uh, I had a '69 Camaro that was my it was like a total street rod, so I never would drive it anywhere far because you know it would always break down, it had problems. <laughs> so my mom had this like '70 I don't know what year this thing was, late '70s Ford LTD station wagon. You know, things enormous. So I borrowed her station wagon. My friend and I we jump in that. And we head up. It's an hour from where we live to the Capitol Center. See the show. We come out. We're sitting in line to get out of the parking lot starts overheating I'm like shit what are we going to do i mean i don't have anything with water so we pull we get out of line we park the car and so we're going around picking up beer bottles because there's plenty of them on the ground and we're looking for some place that we go back up to the actual building of the capitol center to to the loading ramp and we we found some jugs of some kind of what this stuff was and we're filling things with water trying to you know so we could put water in the, in the radiator for what it would do i don't know because uh, I think it had sprung a leak. So anyway, so we're down the ramp. The doors open up. And there's some commotion. We're over, we're literally at a spigot on the side. It was like a, like a, a movie. I mean, it was like almost famous or something. We're, we're filling up all this stuff. We're, you know, limos start coming out. The limos come out. The one stops where, and the window comes down. Dave 
it's like hey guys what's going on we're like rock and roll and I'm like yeah and we're and we're like how dumb do we feel right now and he threw a shirt out at us there was some people in the car it was a lot of commotion the window goes up and off they go and we're like well what do we do now i mean did that just happen we're both like we'll just fill up our bo- beer bottles with water and our jug here and we'll go back we'll just walk out of our car like you know how dumb do we feel right now? Just, but it was, it was just one of those weird moments in, t- you know, in your life. It's like, you can't believe these things are happening, you know, kind of thing like that. And, That's and then right. a million years later, you know, selling a house literally a block from him, you know, on his street and being, you know, around all that stuff, you know, a million miles from where I grew up, you know, which is even, even stranger, you know? Yeah. I was saying that to uh, one of my guests who, who lived out there. I think Craig, uh, same thing. He was East coast guy. Moved to LA, you know, and and all these years later, he ends up with Ed at his studio. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like you know that whole thing about manifestation. You know, how you could think think it into your consciousness. Oh, yeah, totally you, know, you suck it in, right? Somehow it happened, you know. And 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 like you, you go all the way out there from the inspiration this guy injected, mm-hmm. and and then you end up in, in his orbit in a way that you would never had thought you could. Yeah, I mean, dude, how many people are there on the planet? <laughs> a lot, <laughs> right? I know. And how I know. many? How many Eddie Van Halen's were there? One. And you One. ended up in his orbit, and you ended up in yeah. his, you know, presence, and you got to see him play Eruption in your face, and he gave you a, a big afterward. I mean, it's like yeah, you know, it, I remember it was so loud. I mean, <laughs> it was like you know, it's like if you go to the drag races, you sit at the starting line when they, they take off, and it's like this vibration goes through your body. Yeah, that's how loud it was when he was playing. I mean, it was mind blowingly loud on stage. Yeah, because I was, you know, again, speaker level. So with the height of the stage with the bottom cabinets would have been, you know, really right face level. Right, right. And it was ripping, like ripping you apart. Know, no, yeah, but it was, but it was really clean and clear. Mm-hmm. It was just super, super loud. And, and people um, talk about his rig, you know, and and his gain and all. 